I'm Mike Stone. I'm the go-to-market lead for, for automation at Chainlink, and today I'm joined by Sam from RoboVault, and today we'll be talking about uh, use case deep dives for Chainlink automation. So, I don't know how to go back. Okay, smart contracts are asleep by default. I skipped the agenda, um, meaning they require someone or something to come along and interact with them. So if there's something that needs to happen regularly in some sm smart contract that you're writing or you need some automation to occur, uh, some external system needs to interact with it, right? So in order for that to happen, there have been a few tools that have cropped up, like Chainlink Automation and some others, um, to solve this problem exactly. Now, it's actually a very, very difficult problem to solve, right? Because for any automation to occur, you need to check to see if some automation needs to happen or some transaction needs to occur. And then on the other side of that, you need to send the transaction, right? So you need to account for things like chain reorgs. You need to account for uh, what gas price to use. You need to account for how do you manage transactions and things like that, which, again, is, is a lot harder than it seems. And if you are creating an automation or you need something to happen regularly, um, you're going to want to maintain decentralization across your entire stack. So at the end of the day, you're really only as decentralized as the least decentralized part of your stack. Now, uh, any automation in general has really two things you should consider. So first is the check. So something should be checking regularly to see if some automation needs to happen. Now, that can be as simple as a time-based check, right? Do you need something to run every hour? Do you need it to run once a day? Or it could be more advanced. Are you checking the state of the chain? Are you checking the, the balance of a wallet? Are you combining lots of things to, to decide under what conditions you'd like to send some transaction? And then on the other side of that, you need to send the transaction itself. You need to perform some work. And, um, and those are the two main features you need to, or functions you need to think about. Now, there are some best practices you should consider if you're looking to automate smart contracts, um, especially using something like Chainlink Automation. And the first one is you should assume that anyone can and will interact with your contract at any point in time. And I think that's kind of just a best practice when writing smart contracts, right? Um, but on the other side of that, uh, if you are um, assuming that anyone can interact with your contract, you also want to make sure that uh, when they do, you're revalidating any conditions that you set in your check, right? So if somebody does try to interact with your contract out of turn, whether maliciously or not, they shouldn't be able to do so, and that transaction sh should revert. Um, third thing here is you should leverage off-chain computation, and this is a, a feature specific to Chainlink Automation. So during this check, there's a, a special feature where um, since these checks are happening off-chain and they're technically simulated, you can offset a lot of your computation to this check, meaning do lots of work off-chain during that simulation, pass the result of that computation to the transaction, and then you can save a lot of gas in doing so. So you're just really, at the end of the day, doing the work that you need to do. And then last thing is uh, beware of gas spikes, right? If uh, NFTs become very hot again, and these NFT mints are happening all the time, you want to make sure that um, when you're performing your transaction, gas price, prices aren't spiking, and you're not wasting all of your funds, and that uh, really, at the end of the day, if, if you need whatever action you're taking to be profitable, that it will, and you're not you know, wasting a lot of money w when you don't need to. And you can add those checks into your contract directly. Now, I want to talk through a, a specific real-world use case from Stakedown. They're using Chainlink Automation today to automate fee distribution in their, in their, uh, in their contract. Uh, and this is what it looks like in practice. So, so here's some quick code. Um, here you can see the check upkeep function. This is a, a checker function. And in here, what they're doing is, uh, and this simulation happens every block, by the way, for Chainlink Automation. So they're checking to see if uh, the balance of some vault exceeds a threshold that they've set. So again, this is happening every block, constantly checking. Uh, and then you can see that upkeep needed equals true. They're just returning a value of true, meaning they need some transaction to be sent. So again, checking every block uh, for these conditions. And then this second function is called perform upkeep. This is the transaction that they want to send whenever those conditions that I just went through uh, happen to be true. 
And you can see they're following the best practice here to revalidate the condition to say, again, only continue with this transaction when the balance of this vault has exceeded that threshold. And then they want to call this earn function on the vault. And this is kind of the full end-to-end -end automation, which is really nice. Now, I'd like to pass things over to Sam from RoboVault, who's building some really, really amazing uh, functionality. And uh, they've got lots of automation baked into this. So, Thanks a lot, Mike. Sam. Yes. Thanks a lot, Mike. Um, I'm, I'm Sam, CTO of RoboVault. We're a DeFi um, uh, product on Avalanche. Uh, and our goal is to um, bring automated, advanced automated delta neutral strategies uh, to DeFi. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the single asset uh, strategy landscape in DeFi. And I'm going to dig into a little bit about what we do, how we tackle um, impermanent loss, and how we, how we actually hedge it. Um, and then the, the vital role that, that Chainlink takes, um, plays in, in, our, in our product. Cool. So at a glance, this is the, the single asset strategy landscape in, in my mind. Uh, so from on, on the left-hand side, it really goes from uh, less complex to more complex. Um, but we've got uh, auto compounders, uh, lending market folding, and, and stable LP farming. Um, so I won't go into the details, but broadly speaking, uh, it's essentially users deploying assets uh, to, to products and then uh, uh, auto compounding the governance reward emissions. Um, where the, the, there's a new exciting area that's, that's coming out in DeFi at the moment um, that, that we're really excited about and where we focus, and, and that's in, in delta neutral strategies. At the moment, there's, there's a real challenge for DeFi users hoping to get the best returns on their assets at the moment, um, and that is trying to deploy assets to LP, to liquidity pools, so AMM such as UniV2, UniV3, um, and others. Uh, the, the issue is that impermanent loss has proven to be a, quite a beast to wrangle. Um, some notable institutions have, have been very publicly um, struggled to, to hedge it. Um, and so this means for users it's really difficult to get access to these higher yields without um, getting exposed to this, um, to, to impermanent loss. Um, and so what we do is that we try and automate this. We, we've built a hedge um, and we automate the hedging of impermanent loss. So what that looks like on paper is this is an example of one of our strategies. We, we call this our, our core delta neutral strategies. Um, so I'll just walk you through this example. So a user deposits USDC. Uh, a portion of that deposit gets deployed to a lending platform such as Aave. Um, a secondary token is then borrowed against that and then combined with the initial capital um, to deploy to an LP position. At first glance, this looks like it's somewhat hedged. The, the, borrow, the amount you're borrowing is the amount you're deploying into the LP position. Um, so the market moves, you should be able to pay it back. However, that's not how IL works. Um, the, the, there will be a discrepancy as the market moves between the borrowed amount and the amount in the LP token. Sorry, in the, in the LP position. And what's that look like? So this is a, a standard um, impermanent loss curve. So what you would expect is, say, if there was a 50% market movement, you'd see a, a minus 2.5% drawdown in that LP position. Um, and for a, um, a, a, we consider that a completely broken hedge if, if, if we saw drawdowns like that. So how do we tackle that? So if you, if you look at this chart closely, you'll see um, towards the 0%, the so within, with small um, market movements, the curve is actually quite flat. So what we do is we ensure that our positions maintain within this really tight range. And so there is a very small amount of IL that happens within this, well, in, within this range, but on a day, sorry, an hours to days um, time scale, the, 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 the rewards you earn from fees um, is more than, than, the IL, than the impermanent loss that the strategy experiences. So how do we do this? Uh, we have uh, automation that monitors our strategies and triggers what we call rebalance transactions. So anytime the position moves outside of this predefined range, a transaction is thrown on the blockchain, and we, we try and land that as fast as possible to rebalance the position. So if you see a really big market movement, there'll be a bunch of small rebalances just to keep the position in check. Um, so what's that look like in practice? Um, we've had th this chart shows our, our vaults over the past uh, 12 months or so in comparison to a competitor. 
um, doing, doing one of the simpler strategies. Uh, and we've had multiple iterations, so there's a few gaps in the chart. However, over this 12-month period, as we've been improving and refining our product, we've, we've um, outperformed the market. However, this isn't easy. There, there are some challenges, and as I said, there were, we've, we've iterated and improved on our product. What, I've got, what, a, what, what you see here is an example of an incident that happened in December of, um, of last year, where our keeper, sorry, our, our automation, um, is also known as, as keeper, went down for about 15 minutes. And during that 15 minutes, there was a 30% market move. And what that resulted in was a 35-bit uh, drawdown on our strategy. Um, for a, a hedge strategy, that's unacceptable. It's um, uh, too much. So we needed to work out what went wrong and how to solve this. So we went back to the drawing board. At this stage, we had our own custom uh, off-chain infrastructure, our, our keeper that would monitor the blockchain, trigger these transactions. Um, and that's, that's what failed. So we, we sort of went back to the drawing board, try and work out how we can improve that and make it more reliable. We came out of that realizing it's really, really challenging, that automation, off-chain automation is super, is, is actually surprisingly complex. You've got to worry about reliability and uptime, security, uh, gas pricing mechanisms. This one's a really important one, particularly when there's big gas spikes, um, nonce management and, and, and chain reorgs as well as co node co-location, so you get the fastest data. So we looked at this and we're like, all right, we need to do this to ensure that, that our product and our hedge maintains. Um, it, it's the, the hedge is successful, um, so we started like, revamping our roadmap and, and, and looking at how much time we're going to invest into it. However, then we, we had a thought that we'd look at what, what products were out there. So we, we found a bunch of automation products that are available in the market, and we figured, hey, let's just chuck them in the race, get them to compete with our custom keeper. Um, it gives us some redundancy, and, and let's see how it performs. So we ran that for, for a few months, um, and unfortunately, we found that our in-house keeper was actually more performant than the available off-the-shelf um, infrastructure. Uh, this wasn't the outcome we were hoping for, so it was back to revamping the roadmap. However, the timing was perfect. It was right when Chainlink had just deployed their chain, Chainlink automation to Avalanche, which is where we were deploying at that time. And during, during the months prior to this, I'd been monitoring Chainlink's Oracle updates, and I could see that they were landing transactions successfully and reliably when we were really struggling to. So I was, I was, I was super excited to, to try it out and chuck it in, the, in the, the race and see how it performed. The outcome was we were stoked with the results. So Chainlink automation has landed in the past four months 81% of our rebalance transactions um, out of the about 200 transactions we've needed. Um, our in-house keeper was only 18% of that, um, which, which we know is relatively reliable. So that, that speaks to how, how strong Chainlink's automation is. And then the other keepers were still running in um, concurrently at this time and only landed about 1%. So, we're, this essentially solves our keeper and our automation problem that we have. What, what that means for us is that we no longer have to um, invest stacks of resources into building off-chain automation and getting that, that reliable. Now we can focus on what we're really interested in and what we're really good at, and that's building delta-neutral strategies. Um, so here's just at a glance some of the strategies that we've got on the cards for the future. I won't go into detail. Um, but we're really excited about the future of Delta Neutral Strategies in, in DeFi. I think it's going to be a big part of, of yield in, in the coming years. So thanks a lot for having a listen. Um, if you want to see what we're doing, come check us out at robovault, robo-vault.com. You can find me on, on Twitter, um, at, at SmoothBots. That's my alias I go by. Um, and uh, we're also part way through a seed round. So if you're interested in being involved, um, hit me up on Twitter. Thanks a lot. Thank you.